And we are back with a, a massive sort of detour from our fitness books. We've now gone into something which is, I wouldn't even know how to describe the sort of um, the category of this book. It's kind of like social commentary, politics, psychology, yeah, uh, history of science, philosophy, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a bit of everything. And it's called The uh, Psychology of Totalitarianism by Matthias Desmet. Uh, I think I pronounced his name right, but I can Matthias never know Desmet, this. Yeah. Matthias, yeah. Um, and to be honest, we both read this quite a long time ago. It, I, th I believe it got published after COVID, I think, or it was being written during COVID. Mm -hmm. And I want to even say it might have been prompted to be written by COVID because he obviously he links back to sort of um, the government interventions and the reasoning behind why they could be quite flawed, etc. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he talks about this idea that we're sort of rising or, go or going to or heading towards a sort of totalitarianism as a sort of like society structure. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I I absolutely love this book, and I actually can't wait to to get into it. It, it kind of covers like a massive range, like we said before, of, of topics, yeah. not just yeah, psychology. Yeah. I mean, obviously, by the title, you think, oh, it's just psychology book, right? But it's way more than that. Um, yeah, no, exactly. he, hits, he hits on points that we've been talking about on this on this channel for a long time. Um, you know, just linking in with stuff from um, the matter with things and Ian McGilchrist and stuff like that. It's just yeah, it's just right up that street. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I remember coming across him during COVID and he was being interviewed. He's a psychology professor at, uh, I can't remember what university it is. I think it's somewhere in like Brussels. I want to yeah, say. Yeah, no, it is something like that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he kind of was just observing it almost like a meta, meta observation of what was going on in society with the governments all around the world implementing certain rules and what, how, what those rules kind of reflected and whether they were a reflection of like the kind of setup of society and these kind of issues that we'll talk about leading to this kind of almost inevitable um, scenario. And yeah. yeah, I remember coming across his points on like a interview with, I think, what was his name? Um, oh, he runs a kind of, not chat show, but he interviews people. Del Bigtree, that's his name. And then, um, and then he was recommending his book, and so yeah, came across that, and someone else recommended it as well, and yeah, it was just really, really hit home. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get stuck into. it. I just wanted to say before we do is, I feel like sometimes books like this get quite a bad rap because they kind of form like uh, the the main arguments for lots of conspiracy theories and stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people just like shoo shoo books like this who like critique the mainstream ways of thinking and think, oh, this is just somebody who's got like a bone to pick and he's all about conspiracies and stuff. But for me, this book, like it's hard to read it and not agree with half of the stuff he's saying. Mm -hmm. um, and what I quite like as well is it's, it's kind of like really delving down into the core of where all the issues are coming from in society rather than just, you know, um, blaming it on some sort of, some form of psychology. He's actually just talking about how it's mainly around the philosophy and the way we actually see the world as yeah. a collective in comparison to the past and yeah. i thought this so interesting because obviously we've, we've spoken a lot about um how science can't really replace religion in some degrees because it doesn't create like a re like a reason for living almost right like and this is kind of what he goes into like we've lost our reason that and like as they say in french the reason of it's being like yeah. yeah it's it's and when you realize that it's like okay what is going to replace that reason um yeah. and that's what he kind of delves into and uh, I believe he came up with the idea of mass formation as well. I think it's his idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, this, this, this is like a kind of, you know, obviously he's talking about how one gets to a totalitarian kind of state. And this is basically just one theory in it. And mass formation is kind of, I think, I did, I can't remember if he termed uh, termed it, like coined the term, but... Um, I think, I want to say he did, but yeah. But essentially it's just taking a lot of different issues that are present in society that probably won't come as a surprise when we when we mention them because they're very prevalent but it's taking that amalgamation and showing like kind of what it leads to um yeah and yeah so it's just obviously a theory at the end of the day but there are so many books out there that do that and just because this kind of touches on quite controversial topics and like you said can lead into that um kind of conspiratorial world 
mm. that it should just be rejected and neglected and mm. disregarded for that reason. Um, no, I think it's it was a great book and it makes a lot of sense on uh, on a lot of levels. Um, yeah, yeah. So we'll jump straight into sort of the introduction. We're going to do as always the the structure of the book based upon chapters and then go through the points that we extracted from each chapter. So one of the first points we got from the introduction was about mass formation. So mass formation is in essence a kind of group hypnosis that destroys individuals' ethical self-awareness and robs them of their ability to think critically. This process is insidious in nature. Populations, populations sorry, fall prey to it unsuspectingly. To put it in the words of Yuval Noah Harari, who wrote Sapiens, most people wouldn't even notice the shift toward a totalitarian regime. We associate totalitarianism mainly with labour, concentration and extermination camps. But those are merely the final bewildering stage of a long process. Mm. And that was super interesting because it kind of like, it does make sense. Those those are like the end point of the movement, if that makes sense. Yeah. This is like yeah. the last stage of the movement. But the seeds are sown away before that. And I think it's something that we forget that, that it, obviously that's a point in, in, the, in the stage, but like the stuff happens before that, which wasn't yeah. so obvious if that makes sense like it doesn't just like come out of nowhere there has to be some sort of causes yeah. that lead up to it um and it's so yeah. incremental as well i think you know we've talked about this in our um podcast on evil but mm. because you don't notice the shifts so much and that they're so slight you end up you know before you know it in a position where you know it 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 well, it's, it's, Mil, it's Stanley Milgram's kind of experiment with the shock, you know, it's you're just implementing tiny l little extra shocks. And before you know it, you're inflicting a lethal shock to someone. Um, mm. And it's the same thing with this. And it's, it's, it's an ideological incrementation, you know, it's, it's slight changes that change your ideology. So you don't even realize that when you're at that end point, you're like, well, okay. I mean, what, why is this not normal? You know? Um, yeah. No, it's like you said, it's it's stuff that it's the little mini steps that you think are sort of there's nothing wrong with it. Like, for example, taking away certain freedom, like freedoms based upon certain circumstances. Mm. But once that happens, what stops them from changing the circumstance slightly to then incorporate the same sort of restrictions, etc. Right? I mean, this is what the book gets into, right? But yeah, the whole yeah. point here being that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, there's a good reason, and I feel like a lot of these things start from like really good reasoning, like good intentions. Like we want to keep people safe, we want to do this, we want to do that. But what they don't realize is they set a change of uh, sort of like a chain of events where it's like, okay, we're now deciding what's the good. You know, we're deciding what's for the good of the people. We're deciding for this based mm. upon science or based upon objective data, which we'll just which we'll get into later. Which is one of his main gripes of all of this is it's you know doing stuff in the name of science. Yeah it's not a good reason to do things. Let's put it that yeah. way. Just because you did, science has been sort of, I was the word, uh, taken hijacked. over to some respect, yeah, hijacked and used for, uh, I guess you could say nefarious purposes, but also just for individual self-interested purposes or system-based, uh, you know, uh, incentives, etc. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into this next part. So the corruption of science. Sloppiness, errors, biased conclusions, and even outright fraud had become so prevalent in scientific research that a staggeringly high percentage of research papers, up to 85% in some fields, reached radically wrong conclusions. And the most fascinating thing of all, from a psychological point of view, most researchers were utterly convinced they were conducting their research more or less correctly. Somehow they failed to realize that their research was not bringing them closer to the facts, but instead was creating a, fic a fictitious new reality. And just a point on this, like I remember being at uni doing psychology. And one of the things that you're taught is that 72% of papers are, can't be replicated. And what I find so fascinating about that is that you're taught to recognize that. And then almost it's almost like you've just checked the box and then you continue doing the same exact thing that everyone else is doing that can't be replicated. Yeah. And it's, it's um, fascinating. It's like, Oh yeah, we've got this huge issue. I'm glad we've talked about it. Let's move on. And just, just yeah, keep, yeah. You know, I was, I was actually going to add as well. Funny enough, when you talked about the fact that it was when you're at university, you realized this, cause I've realized at university too, when we did our, like, um, I guess you could call the equivalent of a dissertation and we do like a research project, mm. let's just say, um, we we kind of replaced like actual inquiry like scientific inquiry and like trying to find the truth with just process and method yeah. Yeah. so like it's like if you follow this method you're doing science you're doing the yeah, process yeah. 
and it's kind of like that's replaced now almost like okay like like you just said they don't like they've said to you okay 75 percent of the research can't be replicated but don't worry about that let's just keep continue doing the research yeah, yeah. the same yeah, way yeah. we've always done it kind of thing it's almost like yeah. the actual search for truth has become replaced with just make sure you fit like you tick the box you do the process correctly and that is from for like all intents and purposes that's okay with us yeah we know that it might or might might or might not be correct but you know it's still science or some form of it's still research right and yeah. it's just like okay that's kind of as we'll see later on this it's kind of massively fallen from the origins of what science was intended to do uh yeah. it was intended for us to be skeptical for intended us to sort of rigorously check results but now it's just become like oh if you tick the box you've done like a peer-reviewed study um you know if you just followed the steps and you've created a study in the way that we say in this like sort of framework oh it's all good it's science it's research it's just like yeah. okay well as we as we know from obviously all the stuff we've read it's like it's just not quite as simple as that there's so many factors that can influence studies and research and it's just Absolutely. it's just it's just really telling when he's talking here about like you know some places or some uh research areas 85 percent are just not even like replicable and therefore as well if they're taking these conclusions and creating further conclusions further tests further ideas one we're wasting money and two we're just convincing people of something that doesn't yeah. exist it's... which it, it makes me think that science is very it can only be conducted if the scientist or the researcher is either passionate about it or holds mm. their integrity because i think uh, doing science doing science it's mm. difficult it's not there there isn't a there isn't a manual that you can follow but yet we've this convinced thing, ourselves yeah, yeah. that yeah. there is a manual and that by just following it it is science but the fact is we don't question the manual in itself so we're just replic funnily enough we're replicating unreplicable um studies by just following the same method time and time again i feel like the only reason the only way good science ever comes about is when someone is genuinely interested in something and wants to find the answer rather than <laughs> i'm just going to write an article you know i was about to say uh, to you if you think about all the sort of great scientists who are like yeah. adorned and like have just massive like legacies yeah exactly right? they were absolutely absorbed by finding the truth you know yeah. there was that was like their reason that they were, they were almost yeah yeah exactly um and yeah, they, they weren't going to settle, settle for anything but the truth. Yeah. And I also thought it's quite interesting where some of the experiments they did and the studies and the research they did was not the standard research that everybody else does. It was like they created their own idea of what the experiment would be to prove what they wanted to prove. And therefore, yeah. we are slipping up on the fact that actually to prove things in my head, we need to come up with almost creative ways to, to, to create these studies and research programs, right? Not all the time. Don't get me wrong. This yeah. is not like a like across everything, right? For example, medical stuff, you've got to like, you can't just be like, oh, let's just inject 50% of the population with this. You know, you should get what I mean. Well, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, besides that, it's just like, they have to actually have a level of like imagination. But like, so yeah. we've been taught like a process. You have to follow this, 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 and this. Whereas the people who actually created the biggest um scientific like revolutions and developments were the ones who literally went okay right this is like the standard way we measure these things but i'm yeah. i'm i'm um theorizing on a sort of paradigm shift and you can't measure a paradigm shift by the, the old ways of measuring so you have to create yeah. your own version of an experiment yeah. where you're like this proves that what i'm saying is true but like yeah. you're being stifled then in in this sense because everybody's following the same process yeah. not necessarily but within categories or like you know certain things like for example psychology mm -hmm. or business you're kind of taught like research methods, research tactics. And I get it at the yeah, same time. You're like, yeah, yeah. you're meant to learn the methods and then come up with like a creative way of deploying them. But at the same time, you're never really taught that that's actually the, the main part of it. The main part of it is actually thinking, okay, what am I trying to prove? Yeah. What is actually going to be the most objective way of proving this? How yeah. am I going to get it as close as possible to a real world test rather than just in a laboratory where somebody knows they're being paid to do a test, which is completely yeah. different to real life. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's this, it's this type of thing that people just don't even, it's almost like, like we said, it's just ch like ticking a box. It's like, okay, we followed the process. So it's research yeah. rather than we haven't actually proved anything here. We haven't actually yeah. done anything. That's like actually like, oh, so we're like rigorous mm. um, double checking. We haven't actually asked the question of like, how could this test be completely wrong? Don't get me wrong. There is actually a lot of science out there and scientific research that does do this. And they, they do even probably put stuff like in the end, like the abstract, like nothing conclusive can be taken from this. But the <laughs> problem that we have with society, right? And this is, we'll get onto this later. I mean, we'll yeah, we'll yeah. jump in the gun here a little bit. Is the fact that 
then media jumps in, sort of takes like one of the sentence and be like, this kind of like suggests something and yeah. immediately puts it out to the public being like, scientist proves this or something. Yeah. Scientist does this. There is a chance of this when in reality, the person literally said something like, like there is a chance, but like, you know, the rest of the study says like it's negligible or like it's, it's just, it could just be, um, what's the word? Uh, what's the word? Uh, it's not causation. It's correlation. That's it. Yeah. It could just be correlation. Yeah, yeah. Right? And it's just like, Oh, it's crazy. No, it is. It's frustrating. Crazy state of affairs. But I think it's, once again, it's that kind of societal shift to wanting to convince yourself that you've done something, wanting to convince yourself that you have done science and that you've created something without needing to put in the extra hard work to actually delve in and find all the issues um, yeah. surrounding the methods that you use, the measures, the metrics. I mean, um, you, and that's part of the reason why I was so kind of deflated about doing my uh, dissertation because all the things that we were using were flawed and it's not like I have the time to look into all of them and be like oh well the sample is very biased and the measures that I've got here are, have this kind of level of validity it's it's difficult when you don't have that much time and that's why I think the greatest scientific discoveries are normally done by people who almost commit their whole lives to it to a degree you know they take one topic and you're almost a, it's something that I have so much respect for when someone just has one topic and they follow it through with so many years, but down to the like micro detail, like Ian McGilchrist is one of them, right? Yeah. Like following this idea and having giving 30 years of his life to it. But um, yeah, it's just, and because I know that my results aren't ever going to actually amount to anything because there are so many flaws in the system that I was like, well, I, you know, why, why do this? Um, yeah. But it's definitely an interesting point. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, maybe, I'll, before we yeah, as I was say before we continue, like we're just gonna have to get through some of this because obviously this book summary could be could be very, pretty long. Very long. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a book. Um, yeah, literally. Uh, this, of course, is a serious problem, especially for contemporary societies that place their faith in science as the most reliable way of understanding the world. The poor quality of scientific research reveals a more fundamental problem. Our scientific worldview has substantial shortcomings, the consequences of which extend far beyond the field of academic research. These shortcomings are also the origin of a profound collective unease, which in recent decades has become increasingly palpable in our society. People's views of the future is now tainted with pessimism and lack of perspective, more so every day. Should civilization not be washed away by rising sea levels, then it certainly will be swept away by refugees. The grand narrative of society, the story of the Enlightenment, no longer leads to optimism and positivism. Much of the population is trapped in almost com uh, complete social isolation. We see a remarkable increase in absente absenteeism due to mental suffering, an unprecedented proliferation in the use of psychotropic drugs, a burnout epi uh, epidemic that paralyzes entire companies and government institutions. The coronavirus was not unexpected, but, ra uh, but, part relevant, but rather part of a pattern of escalating and counterproductive societal reactions to sources of fear, including terrorists and global warming. With a new source of fear emerges in, um, in society, the prevailing mode of thinking dictates, uh, dictates only one response and solution, greater control. Yeah yeah i'm gonna before we can talk we're gonna definitely touch on some of these points later on so i think we're just gonna keep going for now but yeah, there yeah. is there's something to be said for that so yeah. the the failure of the grand narrative so we have to consider the current fear and psychological discomfort to the pro to be a problem in itself a problem that cannot be reduced to a virus or any other object or threat such as terrorism or whatever our fear originates on a completely different level that that of the failure of the grand narrative of our society this is the narrative of mechanistic science in which man is reduced to a biological organism, a narrative that ignores the psychological, symbolic and ethical dimensions of human beings and thereby has devastating effect at the level of human relationships. Something in this narrative causes man to become isolated from his fellow man and from nature. Something in it causes man to stop resonating with the world around him. Something in it turns a human being into an atomized subject. It is price, uh, precisely this atomized subject that, according to Arendt, is the elementary building block of the totalitarian, totalitarian state. Totalitarianism is not a historical coincidence. In the final analysis, it is the logical consequence of mechanistic thinking and delusional belief in the ob omnipotence of human rationality. And yeah, I mean, 
we could we could riff on this now, but I was thinking because I, I think we touched on it later. It's just this idea yeah. that obviously we kind of lost touch with the ethical part of our nature, right? Like everything's yeah. become about science. It's become like you know we're just like biology, we're just chemistry, we're just yeah, exactly we're just atoms. So what's the point, kind of thing? Yeah. And you can see it throughout, like even like popular science. Uh, sorry, popular science, popular culture, and like popular comedies and stuff. Like even thinking about Rick and Morty and stuff like that. Yeah, these yeah, shows yeah. are like very much like bring about the ironies of the reality that nothing matters and it's all just yeah, a joke yeah. and stuff. And when, when you live in a world that that's the case and what's the point of living kind of thing, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's quite sad in that respect. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, and I think people feel it, you know, I, th I think people feel that we reduce everything down basically just to a function, just to something mm -hmm. that can be controlled. Um, and like, like, you know, it, uh, the first point said, you know, reducing everything down to like an object of fear, something that can be, you know, manipulated um, to control. And I think, yeah, I think it's very prevalent. And I think a lot of people feel it. Maybe they can't articulate it or it's not explicit, but I think people definitely feel that we have this. And, it, and once again, it ties in with Ian McGilchrist's work, you know, this idea of like reducing something, but then not putting it back into the whole. We just leave it at there, at this reductionist point. Um, and it probably explains quite a lot with uh, with today's society. Yeah. Um, all right, so on to uh, the next section. So part one, science and its psychological effects. Chapter one, science and ideology. The emergence of science marked a significant shift in human thinking. Man began to believe that he could use reason to control the world while remaining unchanged himself. He found the courage to take charge of his destiny, using his intellectual power to understand the world and create a new rational society. For too long, man had been silenced in the name of an unseen God, burdened by dogmas lacking any rational foundation. The time had come to dispel the darkness with the light of reason. This was the essence of the Enlightenment um, period, as eloquently stated by the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant, um, in 1784, enlightenment is man's release from his self-incurred um, uh, tutelage. Tutelage is a man's inability to make use of this understanding without direction from another. Dare to think, have the courage to use your own reason. Enlightenment, I uh, think, is not only made significant intellectual achievements, but also adopted a unique hum uh, humanistic and ethical approach towards the world and its material objects. They had the courage to challenge the prejudices and dogmas of their time, admitting their ignorance and maintaining an open curiosity towards the phenomena of the world. Their willingness to embrace the unknown gave rise to new knowledge, which they valued above all else, even at the cost of their own freedom or lives. The unwavering quest for reason reached its pinnacle by acknowledging the delineating um, and delineating its own limitations. The human intellect humbly recognized that ultimate knowledge resides beyond its boundaries and outside its domain. The crowning accomplishment of science lies in its surrender, its profound realizations that, uh, realization that it cannot serve as a sole guide principle for humanity. At the core, it is not solely human reason that matters, but the individual as a moral and ethical being, existing in relation to others and in connection with the ineffable, which ultimately resonates within their presence yeah i mean this is it's like super interesting once again yeah. that we were just talking about science and obviously how back then when the sort of the scientific movement began they were even talking about this idea that it was they realized their own limitations of it yeah and that obviously there was another dimension to being such as the ethical moral mm. area of living you know like it's i think i want to say it's peterson who, who brought this point to my attention but it was like you can't use science to choose how to behave. Yeah. That makes sense. You can't use scientific reasoning to be like, oh, you should behave this way, if that kind of makes sense. Like, yeah. Because that the scientific kind of way with sort of measurements and objective data and quantifiable variables leads to a few things. And one of them would be like, okay, if I'm going to live, then what can I measure? Okay, money is something we can measure. Therefore, we should maximize money or whatever. Do you got know what I mean? Like it, yeah, yeah, it yeah. focuses on the wrong things. Yeah. Like it, you can't quantify stuff like subjective well-being, right? You can, yeah, I mean, yeah. they, we try in studies. We like, we give number representations to like, how happy are you on a scale of one to seven? Kind of yeah. thing, you know, <laughs> that, yeah. that type of like attempts at quantification. Um, and I just think it's so interesting because it, it is true. Science does not and cannot tell you how you should behave how you should value things 
over yeah. another thing, right? The only problem we have at the moment is obviously we have like a pricing based system in the economy where people then basically value things based upon price, yes. based upon money obtained, right? Because once again, this is the mechanistic sci- scientific like uh, worldview overtaking. It's like mm-hmm. what's quantifiable matters. And we've completely forgotten that there's other yeah. parts such as like being good, like being a good human being and, you know, caring for others that are like technically priceless, right? I mean, that's where the yeah. phrase comes from. It's priceless, yeah, yeah. it's unmeasurable, it's unquantifiable. Yeah. But these are like some of the sort of the key points of being a human, right? Like it's, it's, and, and I, what I find so fascinating is that back then we had the humility to realize that science probably can't answer these questions. And therefore yeah. we need other institutions, other ideas around how to live a good life, right? Or yeah. how to behave. Like, and this is where I agree with the sort of Peterson view, which is like, I think we talked about this many times where like, what is the function of religion? Mm-hmm. And the function of religion is to create stories of which we come to an agreement upon the best way to behave as a human being and the rules that we should abide by without the law kind of thing. With yeah. the law, like, I mean, the law is technically the the religion ethical code encoded into writing, you know, and then expanded yeah. upon. No, absolutely. Um, which, like, technically, if you think about it, there's no scientific way to delineate, oh, should you behave this way? Should you not behave this way? You can create a list of consequences, like, oh, this will happen if you behave this way, this will happen. Yeah. There's no scientific measure that would be like, okay, this is the best path to take. Apart from, obviously, when stuff yeah. like money comes in, it's like, okay, which one gives you the more money? Okay, simple, go that way. Which way does this, which way do you have the most gain or whatever? Like, you know, then it becomes about sort of selfishness, right? 100%. 100%. I think, you know, if... I was to I was visualizing that just then, you know, if you were in court and there is a process of making a decision, and one of the things that will impact that process, that is part of that process, will be science, right? You will it'll be like, okay, maybe this has one component in um, influencing our decision, but it is not the only one, right? And I think you know what dictates when you make the decision is almost your philosophical view of the world. And the issue is what I think we've done is we've adopted science as the only component that impacts our decision making. And as a consequence, it has started, it's it's fueled its own kind of philosophy, its own kind of ideology, where everything is, um, every decision is made upon this scientific, you know, um, result or a conclusion. Mm-hmm. Um, rather, and that's why, you know, I think it was Ian McGilchrist actually, once again, who talked about the failures in society of detaching philosophy from science because you can easily adopt a different philosophy and then that scientific conclusion has a completely different meaning and that's where i think the only way to make the decision is after you've you know taken into consideration scientific evidence and then you take you look through different philosophies almost to come to to make a decision on what you want to do and that's that kind of human aspect right you can't you can't mimic that with science. You, you, it's like, okay, there are multiple different ways that we can make this decision. We could adopt this philosophy or that philosophy or this philosophy. Yeah. But I feel like now we've just become stuck in the same way of seeing <clears throat> things. Um, yeah, and it's, it's quite interesting. And that's, I just, I, I always come back to that point of just, you know, um, linking philosophy with science. Yeah. Otherwise there is no direction. And, then, and because yeah. there's no direction, there's only one direction which is just to consider science and make the decision off the back. Yeah. Of that. Well, and also bearing in mind what we, we will, we will get into it later, but this idea of the mechanistic, um, you know, worldview, which has been given to us by science through like, you know, the study of physics, which has revealed that we, you know, we're all basically a bunch of atoms moving around yeah. sort of even like, you know, the uncertainty principle stuff, like without any like direction and yeah. stuff like this, like it's all just completely up in the mud. It's like, Oh, anything can happen type of thing. You know, yeah. it's not a very like nice world to inhabit right in your head. No. If that's logically true. Then what's it, what's the point of living? I and mean, this is the whole point here. It's like, we've kind of lost this, like, like you said, direction, let's just say, um, which we were more connected to when we had like, religion spirituality like clear ways or clear rules of conduct and to be fair by the way we do still have these things they're just like less spoken about yes you know? yeah, yeah. If, if they didn't exist we wouldn't know what's right and wrong right no, these things still exist yeah. and stuff it's just they've they've almost been put on the back seat whilst we're like oh this science is so good We've, we can figure out truth you know but like some things are like also can be true in multiple ways and this is the part of like mm. being humble and like looking at things in like especially with humans like things can be good and bad at the same time, you know? Science wouldn't yeah. tell that. Science is always, always trying about finding what's certain, right? Like, this is right, this is wrong, yeah. this is this is the way, this is the formula, you know? There's, there's no uncertainty here. Whereas I feel like 
with this type of stuff, we're, we're talking about here about, like you just said, worldviews, philosophies. We've forgotten that we all have our own like philosophies and ways of seeing the world. And there's some ways that are probably more productive to see the world than others based upon the actual yeah. reality of the situation, which is stuff like things can be good or bad. Things can, like, they're not categorically, like, shit. Yeah. They're not categorically yeah, yeah. great. Because you could win the lottery tomorrow. Great. Then you get hit by a train. Bad. <laughs> it's just like... Yeah. Yeah, is it like the context changes depending upon the situation, right? Like, it's nothing is clear cut. Like, wow, this guy won the lottery, but like, he's I don't know, he's he, all his family hate him. He's like, he's left by himself. He's just like, what, you can name a load of bad like maladies or whatever he could have, and it's like, yeah, is that good or bad? And then it becomes like a weighing of value judgments. Like, should you value this above this? And the science can never give you that answer. That and like, and that's exactly. the reason why all of this. Yeah, and I think off the back of that. You know, I wonder if during the Enlightenment period, the reason why there was more humility around science is because there was more of a interest in different ways of thinking as a response to the church and religion saying that there is only one way to think. Mm -hmm. And because of yeah. the contrast, there is, you know, it's almost like, well, what if I don't think like this? And as a result, you know, you start to think of these different philosophies and how science can be used but in different ways and there isn't always one answer so there's it kind of humbles them it, it, there's almost an element of humility whereas in today's society especially in the west or especially in the uk because you don't have that kind of because religion has kind of eroded there isn't as much of a presence of philosophy and we've kind of you know sunk into this particular way of seeing things um mm. I don't know, just a random thought out of the back of, of what you were saying, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting. Yeah, yes. It's so now stuff. we're going to, we're now we're going to follow the, the, uh, the trail of science and how obviously it's changed over time. Mm. So science becomes ideology at its birth. Science was synonymous with open-mindedness with a way of thinking that banished dogmas and question beliefs as it evolved. However, it is also turned into ideology, belief and prejudice. The captivating branch was the mechanistic materialistic field known as the hard sciences, uh, hard sciences. With its simple principles, concrete focus and practical applications, it fascinated humanity. This branch enabled space exploration, global communication, brain imaging, supersonic travel and intricate surgeries. Since the Enlightenment, mechanistic thinking has shaped the Western civilization's grand narrative. It begins with a big bang, leading to the expansion of the universe and the emergence of complex phenomena. Elements formed through fusion and explosion, gathering to create stars, planets, and eventually Earth with its vital water. Amino acids, considered the initial form of life, arise from this water. Guided by natural selection, life evolves from simple to intricate forms, culminating in humankind as the tentative pinnacle. This scientific discourse establishes its own creation myth, reducing human subjectivity to an inconsequential byproduct of mecha uh, mechanistic processes, which is a really, that's a really big point. This change yeah. means man's humanity holds no intrinsic significance. His entire being, his entire being encompassing desires, emotions, longings, romantic expressions, superficial cravings, joys, sorrows, doubts, choices, anger, irrationality, pleasures, sufferings, profound dislikes, and elevated aesthetic appreciations can be ultimately distilled down to basic particles governed by mechanical laws. Such is the fundamental belief of mechanicus, uh, mechanistic materialism. And I mean, just from this, you can kind of understand why, you know, people might be like um, struggling for a reason for things, you know? Like, it's like, yeah. if this is all the case, what's the point? <laughs> like, yeah. I feel like there is this level of like, like existential despair with this. Right. And I remember like, this is why Peter loves to talk about like Nisha and talk about like, the death of God and stuff. It's like when God yeah, died, yeah. Like, what have we done? Because now there's like no point to live. Like nobody has yeah. a reason. Like there's no grand narrative, like shaping humanity. Like, I mean, the, yeah. the only thing you've got to give people like Elon Musk, I know he's like a divisive character credit for the fact that he's actually just thinking about the future. He's like, let's get better. Let's go to Mars. Like, maybe Mars is a bad idea. But yeah. At least he's got this positive mindset. Like let's develop the future. Let's go. Let's as a, as a human race, let's fucking like, let's do something, you know? Yeah. But yeah. Uh, unfortunately with like the mechanistic mindset, it's quite easy to fall into this idea of like, well, what's the point of doing it? Because we're just, mm -hmm. we're just a mechanistic process. I mean, we may have all these feelings, but at the end of the day, it's just atoms. So who cares? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we care. That's the exactly. thing. Like, I feel like we're almost, we're, it's almost like this idea that we have this massive dissonance between, between, sorry, how we actually live our life and how we feel and this yeah. underlying, like, reality that we've been taught, which technically, you know, obviously has proven lots of things, right? Like, it's very, it has practical applications and stuff. 
Yeah. But there's still things that are unproven within it and still things that need to be developed, right? So this might not be yeah. the, 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 you know, the end, end um, reasoning, right? Fuck it. Fuck it. There could be all of this physics stuff, but God did it in the first place for us to discover it and then realize God was real or some bullshit. Like yeah. you can create like, yeah, a narrative yeah. where like it all fits in, right? And it's yeah. not just, is I remember reading um, quite recently, which really got me interested with David Deutsch's like fabric of reality and stuff and mm-hmm. um, his explanations that changed the world. And he talks a lot about how like, science needs explanations as well and what, what a lot of the stuff that we have at the moment is we just have the how the how stuff happens although we don't have the why we're yeah. like oh particles move like this we don't have the why and maybe yeah. that's because we don't imbue meaning onto inanimate objects but they yeah. could be an animate at like a massive scale right you, if you technically zoom in at a cell and you think oh that's tiny we're tiny compared to planets so maybe if you zoom out again there's like a big beast that we're all part of do you get what i mean it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. it's Absolutely. a possibility man like Absolutely. it's this type of stuff that we don't have an explanation for it. We just have like the the yeah what the it is thinking yeah. what it is yeah yeah um, and that's where it falls short with this stuff. And that's yeah, why, like, yeah. um, uh, for instance, like Einstein's theory is heralded as one of the greatest discoveries because it was so in depth and because it kind of had the why behind it. It wasn't just like yeah. this is what a, happens. Yeah. It's like it this is why it happens. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And that's and where the best for scientific theories come in. Hundred percent. And a lot of theories don't have that. They just have that. Like, oh, this is what happens um and yeah you're right without that why what do we do with it well it could be used in multiple different ways but you know we end up resorting to using it in one particular way which reflects our kind of control or our our inclination to control or to exploit Mm. um yeah in a second (laughs) yeah um so next part so the ideological transformation science has undergone a metamorphosis uh akin to all ideologies Initially, it served as a discourse uh, challenging the prevailing majority, only to eventually become the discourse adopted by the majority itself. Throughout this transformation, scientific discourse aligned itself with objectives that contradicted its original intentions. It facilitated manipulation of the masses, provided a means for career advancement, publish or perish, endorsed product promotions, just research (laughs) shows our soap washes the whitest, propagated oh, deceit so i only believe the statistics i faked myself which is winston <laughs> from winston churchill and disparaged and marginalized others for example whoever believes in alternative medicine is an irrational fool i in think fact, that's also super interesting the yes. irrational like the classic oh just because i got some research data which could be completely flawed you're an idiot and it's just like yeah. okay well whatever you get to dictate what rationality is yeah right by, um, literally, by literally having a paper that can prove but but once again that doesn't tell you the core it doesn't research but yeah once again yeah yeah. um in fact it even justified segregation and exclusion demanding the compliance with specific criteria such as wearing masks or possessing a scientific ideology based vaccine passport to access public um, spaces in essence scientific discourse like any dominant discourse has become a favored instrument for uh, opportunism falsehoods, deception, a a manipulation, and the exertion of power. I mean, we've, we've said this multiple times in this podcast before where like we were like likening uh, priests in the past to the new Mm -hmm. scientists in their lab coats, because essentially it's the same thing where we're being told stuff that the general population can't particularly, or maybe can't comprehend because one, we haven't seen the research and stuff. We're basically just trusting based on authority. The point being here is whenever you have like, and we did this on in influence, didn't we? In terms of like one of the the persuasion techniques is obviously through yeah. authority, and people just kind of accept authoritative messages, right? And basically, yeah. science has become the new authority or the new arbiters of of truth, right? A bit like the priest back in the day who communicated with God through prayer or whatever and had yeah, divine yeah. signs. It's it's obviously it's not the same, but it's, it's similar in in mm-hmm. in essence in terms of the the persuasion mechanism is still the same, which is. Yeah this person knows something you don't through some mechanism, whether it's the, you know, God giving a message to the priest or whether it's, you know, it's somebody doing some research, which you, you can't even validate yourself because it's, you know, behind, you know, pick a paywall half the time or, yeah, yeah. you know, not the general population doesn't know a way. I mean, heck, I don't even know a way to sort of go through a scientific research paper and check that the statistics are correct. Cause that's, that's almost like a profession in itself. Yeah. Um, but basically the point being here is whenever there's influence through authority, there's the opportunity, like the opportunities for frauds for people who want to like exercise political power to come in. Yeah. Um, because yeah, like it's one of those things where like, because you're doing it, you're making the appeal for authority, you're less likely to be challenged. 
as well. Yeah. And, yeah, and then funny, funny enough as well, like the, what you're saying here, disparage to marginalize others. Like whenever somebody comes with a conflicting piece of view, because obviously your whole livelihood and your whole, I guess, self-identity could be wrapped up in that opinion. You obviously then go to people, oh, you're an idiot. Like, why do you believe that? You yeah. know, to anybody who believes something different. Yeah. Um, which is just, it's just like, yeah, it's it's crazy because imagine, because if you think about it just throughout history, there's been so many times that people have been proved wrong. Like, can you, I think it was Galileo, wasn't it? He was like thrown yeah. in prison because he, he was telling everybody the solar system was built in a way that was different to the mainstream consensus. Yeah, yeah. He was called a heretic. He was called like an idiot. He was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. sentenced to prison, right? Like it's, but then, but then it gets proven to be right. So yeah, yeah. there is a part where it's like, um, you know, the, the classic idea of history is uh, is written by the victors. Like he, his, his uh, worldview in the end won and now he's a victor. Do you kind yeah. of get what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. Um, no, everybody looks back and goes, those guys are idiots. Like, they're yeah. idiots. They all, yeah, 20 years exactly. time, they're going to come back and be doing exactly the same thing to us. Like, what idiots? Like, why were they thinking that? Yeah. So stupid. No, 100%. And I think like another thing is that it becomes a norm for to use science to um, disparage and manipulate and, uh, the masses. I think a, a big part of this or a thought that I've I've had a lot is – since kind of like the neoliberal age, you know, with the free market, if you give science to people that don't have values to uphold that science as truth, then it ends up being distorted and it becomes a mechanism that loads of people jump on board to use. They see another company that be like, oh, well, they said that they're number one in the country and that this can prove this and this can do that. And because there isn't much regulation in place anymore, um, then they can get away with it and it's and then science just becomes a tool to manipulate masses that's the purpose of it then after that and, and then and then people lose trust in it <clears throat> absolutely absolutely yeah. and, and not even you know it's not even companies but it's also governments as well you know the the mm -hmm. controlling of the masses and it's it's then seen as like oh wow they were able to be successful in a free market by utilizing these tools so why don't we it creates this kind of mimetic behavior where someone else is like well for me to get to the top like that i have to do the same things that they did and then it just becomes an abuse of science um and our trust in science the problem of scientific fraud so full-blown scientific fraud is relatively uncommon and not the primary concern the real challenge lies <clears throat> in the prevalence of questionable research practices which have reached alarming levels in a systematic survey conducted by Daniel Finelli in 2009, it was discovered that at least 72% of researchers were willing to manipulate their research results to some extent. Additionally, unintentional calculation errors and other mistakes were rampant. Uh, Nature ap aptly describes the situation as a tragedy of errors. Consequently, the replicability of scientific findings became a major issue. In simple terms, this means that when multiple researchers attempted to replicate the same experiment, they obtain different results. For instance, replication failed approximately 50% of the time in economics research, around 60% of the time in cancer research, and a staggering 85% of the time in biomedical research. The quality of the research was so abysmal that the renowned statistician John Loandis boldly published an article titled Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. Ironically, even studies assessing the quality of research reach conflicting conclusions, underscoring the profound nature of the problem. The replication crisis signifies not just a lack of seriousness and meticulousness in research, but more importantly, it exposes a fundamental epistemolo epistemological fucking up. That's a one hell of a word, that. Yeah, crisis, an inherent flaw in the way science is conducted. Um, yeah, it's just it's yeah. crazy to think, isn't it? Like, it's terrifying. It and I think, terrifying. once again, it kind of stems back to what we were saying earlier. Like, you know, most of this science, right, like – the government will give grants, but they'll also give grants to be like, okay, we want science to be done on this, like yeah. studies to be done on that, which once again goes against the kind of inherent reason to do science, which is like, I'm passionate about this. It is a problem that I want to solve. I want to dive into this and I want to explore it and I want to find the actual truth. But if someone else has been like, sorry, yeah, we'll give you a bit of money if you go and do this. It doesn't really bode very well. It doesn't give you the motivation or, or momentum and to establish the, yeah. the you know, findings and we're gonna we're gonna get into this later i'm sure but a lot of this also stems from the fact that you know these people who are doing the research often are incentivized for output like we said earlier like people have to sort of publish and perish or whatever publish 
not perish or whatever it was called is the yeah, idea yeah. that you know you need to be outputting as many research papers as possible because the university probably has a quota that they have to hit right and once again this is incentivizing a lack of care speed ease as well like think about it if you have to do as many mm-hmm. research products uh, projects as possible the easier they are to do the more likely you are to do them because to get your output out is like oh jess you need to do 10 research projects a month okay right well i know the quickest one to do is this format so let's just do 10 of them you know well, i can do 10 yeah, easy yeah. like that type yeah, of thing yeah. is that is that mindset like i feel like we're not taking into account here it's just not even just the the it's not even just yeah it's, it's the system almost in itself it's the incentive structure it's the numbers being yeah. measured um and yeah it, the it goal is not to find the me. finding yeah, exactly. The, the goal is not to find the the finding; it's to find anything, almost. As like, I yeah, just need yeah, to do yeah. it. It's like, I just need yeah, to tick yeah. this. The box goal is the process, right? Yeah. And, and funny enough, this actually really this reminds me. I was trying to find the the source or the the place where I heard it. I know for a fact it's definitely Jeff Bezos and Amazon. I'm going to mm-hmm. butcher the quote, but he's he's called his like main hub day one, and he talks about the difference between day one and day two mentality. And day one is sort of like okay, aiming for objectives, yeah. doing aiming for stuff, creating systems, and getting to the objective. Day two is complacency and uh, box ticking. That's the best best way of probably really in my yeah. head at least. He talks yeah. a lot about like when you hit day two and you're just ticking the box because it's a process, and that's that's all you're doing as a business. Like, oh, I just I just did my job. I just ticked the box. You you're going to stagnate and die. Basically, his, yeah. his that was his like idea. So he's yeah. called his literal like hub day one to try and remind everybody that is the day one mindset always there. It's like, exactly. we're not going to rest on our laurels just because it's a process doesn't mean we can't improve the process. It yeah, doesn't yeah. mean we can't change the process. This is the process that got us the last result. But if you want to get to a higher plane, we need a new process type of thing. Yeah. And it just reminds me a little bit of the, there is, there is a connection there. It's the same. It literally is the same pre- premise. It's become more about ticking boxes yeah. and doing the same thing as before rather than, you know, what's the overall objective of this research, right? Like, I mean, yeah. obviously, don't get me wrong. There are plenty of like scientific people out there and scientific like experiments yeah, and course, studies yeah. and research that still abide by this. And, they, and technically, they, they have to, by the method of the process, they have to create like an objective of the study, right? But how many people are actually committed to that objective anymore rather than just ticking the boxes to publish a paper, you know, to to hit their output for the year, yeah. etc. Right? It's, th- it's, like I, yeah. you said earlier, it's, it's changed. Science used to be about like it was the the hobbyists, the people who wanted to know the truth, who were like who were so obsessed with these problems that like spent day in day out trying to figure them yeah. out. Probably not even doing that much experimentation, just like literally trying to get around the head around the actual problem itself. Are the ones who end up changing, you know, the sort of future and creating yeah. that one experiment or the two or three experiments that were like meticulously designed to prove their theories and explanations. Whereas yeah. now, in fact, I'll tell you what, actually, it's just reminding me of, this is the difference, isn't it? Is that paradigm shifting science fees standard science from that yeah. uh, Thomas Kuhn's book, whatever it was, where it was like, yeah. at the moment when you have this new paradigm, everybody's using the same methods and processes to just prove the current paradigm more and try and find out the subtleties within the paradigm. Whereas it's the people who create the sort of, you know, objective massive jumps in understanding are the ones who try and shift the current understanding of like of a of a category of a subject and completely yeah. change the way we test for it. Yeah. Um, so there's like a balance to be made, right? Once again, it's like instead of focusing on output, it should be like focusing on quality as well, quality and output, and also risk taking. Like yeah. this is a risky project. Great. I want 20 of these a year. Like yeah, I want yeah. something which like actually has a bit more to it, you know? But I think that's exactly it. I think the systems sometimes that we design, let's say, okay, originally day one you start by um by you know you have this goal you have this goal we want to find the truth okay and then there's this complacency where you follow this this the process and then i think sometimes the goals can change i think because we don't because we have to meet um a benchmark we have to meet this you know we create systems that dictate what processes we um engage in you know, if the system is like, well, we have to get this kind of, we have to publish this many studies, then it then goes away from like, okay, finding the truth to we need to make this many studies. And then that dictates the process that people engage in. And it almost well, is it, like, it, it changes it's a the bu- incentives as well. Exactly. Like when you change the system, you change the 100%. ways people have to behave to like, yeah. to achieve the things that are being measured against. Yeah. And it, I think yeah, that's why. Yeah. Sorry, just on, 
<laughs> just on the point that I think there is a bi-directional relationship between the process and the product and that both require each other and you have to update each other. If you realize that your goal has shifted towards, you know, meeting this kind of benchmark of how many studies and that your process has changed, then you need to update your goal that will then change the process. Um, it's the constant, we've talked about this in numerous podcasts, but the idea like, okay, yes, you should focus on the process, but now and then you should look up and make sure that you're going to the right goal, right? It's, um, there's a business corollary to that. It's the idea of working in the business vis on the business. Mm. And I think about it quite a lot. It's like the whole point of being a business owner is you're meant to sort of step back every now and again and be like, right, let's work on the systems, on the way we create the value for the customers or whatever, Mm-hmm. and not just in it because obviously when you're in it and working day to day you're checking your emails you're doing what exists already but there comes a point where you have to take a step back like you just said and be like we now probably find ourselves in a different situation like as as always things are changing right the business world is changing but also the scientific world is changing there might be a new theory and you research research paper you step back out you look at all the possibilities you come back and go like how can i change what i'm currently doing to get better results or to, to find out this yeah. new thing you know it's yeah. that is that type of mindset but it requires a certain type of person, I think, personally, to do that. It does, yeah. Um, All right. Well, then, on to the next section. So, <laughs> we haven't even hit chapter two yet. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, this, this may be a two-parter, everybody. I think it's going to... I think so. Yeah. Um, the measurement problem. So, Johan Goeth once remarked that measuring a thing is a crude act, particularly when applied to living bodies, as it can only be done imperfectly. Attempting to measure the immeasurable transforms measurement into a form of pseudo-objectivity, rather than bring the researcher closer to the research object. The act of measurement actually creates a greater divide. It obscures the true nature of the object behind a screen of numbers, which is essentially what we were just talking about. Yeah. Our understanding of objectivity is flawed, heavily reliant on the belief that numbers are the preferred approach to facts. Examining scientific fields with low replicability rates reveal the significance of measurability in play. Chemistry and physics, for instance, fared relatively better in this regard. However, the situation is dire in fields like psychology and medicine. In these domains, researchers grapple with the assessment of highly complex and dynamic phenomena, namely the physical and psychological functions of human beings. Such objects cannot be adequately measured due to their multidimensional nature, yet there are often disparate, uh, sorry, desperate attempts to force them into quantifiable data. In both medicine and psychology, measurement typically relies on tests that yield numerical scores. These figures create an illusion of objectivity, but they require some perspective. Studies examining cross-method agreement ask a simple yet intriguing question. If different measurement, uh, measurement methods are used on the same object, to what extent will the results align? If the methods were accurate, the results should be nearly identical. However, this is often not the case and far from it. The tests and measuring instruments employed in medicine are on average no better than those used in psychology. While metric data may appear to be sophisticated and objective way of describing the research object, it often provides less insight than a skillfully crafted verbal description. This in part contributes to the uh, plethora of errors, carelessness and biased conclusions that have surfaced in the scientific crisis discussed earlier. When researchers try to force the immeasurable into numerical form, they sense that their work holds little genuine (laughs) value. As a result, their motivation wanes and senses of responsibility to produce accurate work diminishes. Most strikingly, researchers themselves often fail to recognize the flaws in their methodologies. They tend to mistake their, um, mistake their scientific fiction for reality, confusing their numbers with distorted echoes of actual facts. This holds true for a significant portion of the population as well, who blindly place their trust in this scientific ideology, lacking alternative uh, ideological refuge after the decline of religion. Many people consider numbers and graphs presented in mass media by individuals with credentials as de facto realities. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so true. It is, but it's also, I think the interesting thing about like numbers and charts and stuff is always like, where has the numbers and charts come from? Yeah. I would love at some point to go into, I know, I think we did the art, the art aligned with statistics before, or did we do a podcast on it or not? I'm not sure um, we did that one, actually. No, maybe we should, but I like, yeah. for me, it's also the idea of like, how are these things being measured? And is there a chance of the fact that it's going to be errors in the measurements? Yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's that type of thinking that people don't, they just see numbers and they think obviously, 
oh, wow, a number so certain, so exact. But it's like, well, it's not. It's just not yeah. exact. I mean, yeah. so many things can, like, it's so hard to measure. Yeah. It's, it's always so hard to measure everything, right? And, like, we've got this, like, we're obsessed with measuring everything. But the reality is we're, like, we're taking proxies for measurements or, like, rough yeah. guesses rather than exact, you know, uh exact values so it's almost yeah. like it should be taken as like a guide post not yeah. as like a truth and unfortunately we've confused the two um, no 100 yes. percent. and just that like you know you kind of almost want different measures to measure the same thing so that you can establish whether there is a more of an objective like result or whether they're all just so disparate the the findings yeah i mean a, an example would be like in genetics for example will you measure a, a trait through like genetic influence uh, shared environment and non-shared environment and normally you know you get quite a big percentage you could be like okay we'll look at twins we'll look at you know um a trait like uh uh what's a standard trait in i mean you could go intelligence conscientiousness or conscientiousness, conscientiousness like yes let's let's go with that okay and then like you measure that and it comes up with saying that okay well there's a 40 percent heritability if that um with conscientiousness okay which means that there's a genetic influence but then when you use a different method of measuring that which is like um uh not quant uh, quantitative qualitative kind of um measurements when you actually measure the genetic codes right so the um genetic variants it you can only they can only find like 0.05% of that trait genetic influence so there's another 39.95 like um uh, percentage that is unaccounted for and yet it's supposed to be genetic and so the point is, is like well where is it and that it just shows you the discrepancies in like different methods approaching the same thing measuring the same exact trait and yet for some reason there's you know we can't find the explanation for it yeah you know uh, uh I want to move on to the next chapter, but I feel like there's something interesting in that point as well about the genetics. Like yeah. it's become so gospel to some degree that obviously there's this like nature nurture debate, whatever, and like genetics yeah, yeah. obviously play a part in the way you develop, right? There's like like your physical form, for example, obviously is influenced by your genetics, right? Um but what I find so interesting as well is like if it's so unproven, like we're well, not well, not unproven, but it's like it's so hard to measure, right? Like in my yeah, head, yeah. I just can't. The amount of complexity to measure how much of a, a gene actually influences, especially behavior traits, because in my head as well, if you believe in that genetics sort or of deterministic viewpoint, it's hard to imagine people changing mm. as well. So yeah. if the more we believe in this like nature nurture, sorry, like it's nature, like you're naturally like that because of your genes, whatever you you remove the human will from the equation and therefore it becomes like this person's bad therefore he's always going to be bad and you lose that ability for change as well so i wonder how much that happens sorry how much that influences let's just say modern day culture where people if they if they believe that like, genes take up a higher percentage chance in nurture they're just like well he's always going to be bad we can't forgive him because obviously 100%. part of like the the yeah. religious experience was all about forgiveness and you know do you get what i mean like there was yeah, parts yeah, of like absolutely. development becoming rather than being stuck in a you know like one of the for me at least one of the the, like defining features of humanity is the ability to change right yes even if yeah. your genes give you a certain like impetus to be a certain way you always have the possibility to change which is like if you think about a lot of the religious like if, especially like the bible and stuff a lot yeah of yeah absolutely. The, the parable is all about choice in that moment temptation and choice it's like you choose but you obviously have all these things that are niggling at you to like go in certain directions but at the end of the day but, you're yeah. the one who makes that choice um and therefore but by having this genetic approach and believing in this determinism we actually remove the agency that we have as a yeah. collective and also the, and also the ability to forgive people because if you believe in that deterministic thing it's like well he, a leopard never changes his spots right that phrase that yeah. like is actually quite poisonous to some degree because it never gives anybody the benefit of the doubt to change yeah yeah i'm um, absolutely a really interesting point i think off the back of that as well like you know by creating a uh, an ideology where you have to take responsibility and that you can always change creates a journey in life where you are confronted with the challenge to try and change it right as in it, it, to develop certain character qualities or to to correct things otherwise if it is the other way then you create a kind of ideology where okay well i can't do anything about this so why does it matter i'll just i'll indulge in it almost i can mm -hmm. use it as a it's, it's genetic I, yeah, it's it like, is oh, genetic. It's it passed is. down to me. It's like, it, you know, it's exactly. Yeah. 
And off the back of that, it almost creates, it kind of falls in line with this nihilistic approach, this mechanistic science. Yeah. Like, okay, one, uh, you know, you could argue maybe it's controlling, like, oh, you can't do anything about it, but you can take a pill, right? Mm. You can't go and change your own behavior, but we've created a pill to kind of maintain you, but you have to take it for the rest of your life, you know? I'm being mm. like, um, squishes, but still, it's just, it's, it kind of falls in line with this nihilistic attitude. It's like, oh well, I can't do anything about it. So why does yeah, it matter? So it's part of it. It's yeah. almost like it's it's almost like the um, the erosion of the human will. Mm. Because actually, if you, I remember I was telling you I was reading that book, by like Jack Pansep, like the um, the archaeology of the mind, right? And he was talking a lot about yeah. his um, almost like the 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 whole point of the prefrontal cortex and stuff is to like make you able to choose, make you able to review your behavior and stuff yeah, yeah, like. Yeah. That is something we are able to do. Therefore, we can change. We can have yeah. impulses. We can decide against it. We can do things we don't want to do. Because, yeah. for example, obviously, it's really nice to have that burger. But then, if we value something else, we can then decide to choose to go after. Right? Like exactly. In exactly. my head, it's I don't know why we fall for this sort of like completely deterministic. Right? Don't get me wrong. I believe there is stuff that's ingrained. Right? Like you don't yeah, choose of course. certain things to like want and desire and stuff to some degree. And there's obviously variation because of like you know genetic variation yeah. through natural selection or whatever. If you choose to believe that, yeah, which I which I do, but it's like you know obviously that there, there is other explanations and stuff that people might buy buy and stuff. Um, but yeah, like in my head, the whole point of having that prefrontal cortex as well was to to change and adapt behavior mm -hmm. to be socially adaptable to 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 be like you know essentially I guess to some degree with the social adaptability is to be like liked and revered like. You have to be adaptable because if you're born into a circumstance where somebody's like everybody's like, oh, we hate this way of behavior. You have yeah. to be able to like use your brain to like like to, to control yourself from behaving in a way that other people don't like. Because otherwise, you'd be ex like you know expelled from the clan or whatever. Absolutely, so you have the ability to be adaptable. So therefore, this gen genetic determinism in my head is like is there. It influences, but it's not the yeah. final factor. Exactly, like, that, that is that is almost like the religious story encapsulates. Like we have this ability, this higher ability to choose and to to do things differently. Yeah, it's like built in if you think about it, and it's it's like healthier against temptations, against you know choosing the choosing to do the right thing, etc. It's all part yeah, of this yeah. religious grand narrative of humanity. Um, it, yeah, it, yeah. That's a bit of a it's risk. it's much healthier for society to adopt that as well because it is essentially at the end of the day a growth mindset compared to a fixed yeah. mindset, right? Um, yeah, I, yeah. I think it's incredibly important, and it's always a bit of both. It, there will always be, yeah, there are genetic um, factors that Im can influence a lot <clears throat> on me. Um, but that's why, you know, the new field of like epigenetics is so interesting because it talks about the bi-directional relationship between the environment yeah. and and genes and how they influence your behavior. Um, uh, and I, I think still, that's how it is. Yeah, I, I still, I, th I want to say, I want to say it was in the matter with things. Um but I feel bad if I actually butcher it and attribute it to the wrong person. But anyway, he always talks about this idea that all biological systems are in a state of becoming. And like, especially with humans and stuff, you can choose what to become. So like, yeah. it's, it's like, I don't know, like if anything, like you're a little, little mini, mini God to some degree, because you actually yeah. have this like executive choice of who you can be. Mm. Um, yeah. And I feel like sometimes with all these, like, like you said, this mechanistic worldview, we've, lost that attunement maybe to the fact that we have the power to change and to do things and we then succumb to this idea of like oh like you basically lose that power that you? you lose the power of your will and eventually you mm. become like this mech you almost become this mechanistic person who just does your habits does what you've always done because you feel like you have no control and i think yeah. that's also where a lot of the anxiety and depression comes from I was as well, a, you're like, literally about to say that yeah. you're like you, you feel you feel like existentialism you're, yeah you feel goalless you feel like you're being dragged by the whims of the moment and i feel like you almost resent like you resent yourself a little bit because you know there's that higher power you have in your head to choose and make a better decision and to change mm. and i thought it was really interesting in the go the turning pro book actually he talked a lot about he was like he was talking about like a cheers to bad events he was like we should all cheers for bad events like being broken up with, being cheated on, because usually fine for some people absolutely destroys them. But a lot of people, it's what actually turns, makes them switch gears and become a better person. Yeah. They're like, yeah. these horrible events make you go, wow, I've got to take stock here. Like they shock you into action. And you're like, wow, I have a choice now. And when you're faced with that choice, 
you you know you then can like turn to become something you want to be or become somebody you don't want to be and actually yeah. like i found in myself whenever i behave in ways that i know is against what i want to become i get upset i get angry yeah. i get depressed yeah. and therefore it's always a case of like you know almost following that intuition of like you know what you want to become so become it and don't um yeah like the more you don't be- don't behave in the way you want to be you the more depressed and anxious you get and then that just gets yeah. worse and worse and i feel like you lose the ability to then like you almost like make excuses for yourself you you fall back into this mechanistic oh it's just this way it's because i'm this way i can't change i'm like yeah um i mean that's Nothing's a my fault crap. Yeah. it's a complete side note but uh, i think but it's, it's really- also an abdication of responsibility to yeah. a degree and that's another reason why it's not healthy for a society that abdicates responsibility because who yeah. do you who do you abdicate that responsibility to the people who will happily take that and then use it against you right it falls right into this narrative of mechanistic ideology it's like okay don't worry you can't do this we'll do it for you but yeah yeah no that's actually really it does all link back doesn't it it's like yeah, yeah if you can't do it for yourself don't worry we're gonna we're gonna be here to help you yeah sort of thing instead of like yeah we're losing the the individual will and then it's being replaced by you know like the support and then you become you need the support etc right yeah. yeah yeah so yeah we're gonna we'll, we'll try and move on to chapter two now i do think we'll, we'll definitely uh do a two-part for this and yeah we'll try and increase the the speed yeah. uh because yeah i think there's at least like 10 chapters or something so something like that <laughs> chapter two science and its practical applications Apo- imposing our will on nature science not only facilitates the acquisition of knowledge and intellectual progress but also exerts tangible effects on the real world for its practical applications in this regard, mechanistic science harbors lofty aspirations. It's aimed to shape the world according to human needs, enhancing comfort, and ultimately eradicating suffering and even death. Consider the advent of the pendulum clock as an example. Prior to its invention, time measurement relied heavily on natural cycles. However, with the introduction of the pendulum clock, people gained the ability to create artificial cycles of any duration simply by adjusting the length of the pendulum arm. As a result, a day could be precisely divided into 86,400 identical pendulum seconds. Time transitioned from an elusive stream of natural rhythms to a quantifiable process, progressing in uniform mechanical steps. For countless millennia, human had been subject to the world's whims. Now, for the first time, man- mankind possessed the power to exert its will upon the environment, fundamentally altering its precarious condition and making life more convenient, or it seems so. Nevertheless, it's undeniable that every added convenience comes with a price including a weakened connection to the natural and social environment. <laughs> really interesting, that point. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I like that. And, and it, and it kind of just emphasizes the fact that, you know, not a creation or an invention doesn't have to be, I mean, it can be good and bad, both at the same time, you know. Um, there is this kind of detachment, like he says, from the social and natural world, but... Yeah. At the same time, it allows us to also do so much more and operate on the same kind of wavelength as others. Yeah, I, I was going to just say my like the John Wick thing is consequences. Like everything <laughs> just has, everything just has consequences. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's like that. It's like you said, it's good and bad. Yeah, I, I can't remember if I referenced this um, in in the last podcast, but I remember somebody. I, I was a podcast I was watching definitely but anyway it was he was talking about this idea of like the, the people who were the first tech companies when the internet was first out they were like this is amazing we're going to connect the world together like it's going to be so good and, and then they forgot to ask the question of is it a good idea to connect everybody together and what would be yeah, the consequences yeah. of that yeah, yeah and obviously the consequences are some people aren't nice <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And then, do you want to be connected with, with these exactly people, and yeah. they're mixing with people who are nice yeah, yeah and then you're ending up with some weird interactions right and it, it, it's kind of interesting like this idea that you're almost always blinded to the consequences to some degree until it already happens yeah yeah 100%. like you're, you're like you're testing you this new thing and, and everybody finds it useful for like like social media right super useful like connect with people you can see posts from people across the world but you also get the bad stuff right people sharing weird stuff people bullying people online etc but this is like you can't really you can try and obviously mitigate some of this stuff but you can't really know that's going to happen until you do it and then you see it yeah um but yeah no exactly exactly it's just yeah the consequences thing gets me the other day i was playing god of war and he said exactly that he was like yeah "Yeah." Yeah, treas was like is it good or bad he was like it's got consequences (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, I thought of you at that point. Yeah, that's funny. I I can't believe John Wick's got into my head that much. It's just because his stupid voice as well. I can't see it. All right, so on to the next one. So, the transformed social sphere. Social connections underwent a profound transformation, reaching state unrecognizable from um, reaching states unrecognizable from previous times. The advent of radio and television marked the emergence of mass media, leading to a significant decline in direct human interaction that primarily <coughs> served social purposes. Traditions such as evening gatherings among neighbors, communal pub gatherings, harvest festivals, rituals, and celebrations gradually gave way to consumption of media content. This shift seduced us into a certain social lethargy as the effort required for genuine human interaction was no longer deemed necessary. Furthermore, public spaces, including the political sphere, increasingly fell under the control of limited number of voices that conquered our living rooms through mass media. Consequently, social relationships lost their diversity and originality. The dominance of a select few voices led to a homogenization of ideas and perspectives, diminishing the richness that comes from a diverse range of social interactions. That's really interesting. It kind of almost yeah. inevitably le- leads to a bit of groupthink, doesn't it? Because you're mm-hmm. reducing the amount of numbers and the amount of like different opinions or thoughts on something. I, yeah. I would also say, actually, funny enough, I think it gave rise to the nation state because you're, you're allowing a public like consciousness to some degree, like you said, because you're reducing the diversity of like mm. beliefs and stuff. Yeah. You're creasing an increased amount of like common beliefs, let's just say. Yeah. And therefore you can create a national identity and national belief system and culture. If Absolutely. you think about that, it, it kind of makes sense because yeah. your your inputs equal your outputs to some degree, or your inputs equal your beliefs to some degree, right? Like you can't yeah. avoid the fact that, for example, what we currently believe is a, a level of our schooling system, our cultural system, and also the books we read, et cetera, right? Yeah, yeah. Therefore, the advent of having, you know, the same message drilled into loads of different people at the same time is obviously going to allow some sort of, like, collective conscious bonding to some degree. Yeah, yeah. If that makes sense. And therefore, yeah, from yeah, that no, era, like, because before then, I think it was, wasn't it based, like, a, we were based in, like, a feudal system, right? A bit more. Like, yeah, it was a bit, bit more, more feudal, so. right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I just feel like, it, it's not a causative factor, but mm. I assume it's like a like it's, it's a factor which increased the the speed of that that transition in my head. Yeah, or or, or enabled that transition. Yeah, it's yeah. right. Like before, then you wouldn't have had this collective agreement of like certain news events of the world or whatnot. Yeah, I mean, this is complete like um, hypothesis here. I don't know if this. No, case. but it would, I, it would make logical sense. This would be like a uh, a factor which would enhance or speed up that. Yeah, yeah, that absolutely. Because I think even if you think about it on like a kind of abstract level essentially it's just distance all Mm -hmm. of these different types of technology are just creating distance between people and when there is distance between someone there is more room for communication to either you have to hold on to it because it's not as easy it's not as bi-directional and also Ah, the message might get distorted over time right yeah um because you yeah. know the radio is one, you know, it's one way. It's a one-way co- uh, conversation. Yeah. So already that changes the whole dynamic of how people converse yeah. or how people communicate. Same thing with TV. Um, mm. Yeah. So it's almost like it almost takes on a dynamic of like a top-down, right? Um, mm. a, a command um, rather than a, it's not a commun- It's not a conversation anymore. There, it doesn't allow for more opinions. Um, yes yeah, it's, it's funny actually now that you say this like like a thought experiment could be something along the lines of like let's say in the past before there was the mass media mm-hmm. the best way of disseminating a message was like a sermon let's just say like you mm-hmm. stood up in front of a crowd right yeah uh with a microphone or whatever yeah you had the possibility of people to have a bi-directionality in the sense they could just shout at you be like yeah. shut the fuck up like you're wrong yeah, like, or like yeah, this you get what i mean like there was an yeah, option yeah. I, I assume social decorum to some degree would have stopped that to some level yeah. but like if you had a voice and you didn't agree you could be able to voice it right hmm. but you're right without this with this new advent it's like there is no bi-directionality bi-directionality it's like yeah. we're just saying this even if you don't believe it, there could be some people literally sat at home shouting at the camera like, you're a fraud, you're a liar. Yeah, 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 there yeah. often is, which is funny because obviously that's the stuff like Twitter now. That's where you get all the, like, you know, the beef, people like you know, leaving nasty comments on social media. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in my head, that's actually take, taking the temperature of the room now. Like a way of seeing if your message is resonating is like, let's have a look yes, at this. Yeah, yeah, see what yeah, people are point. actually saying to your, 
to your shows and it's actually quite funny because obviously so many people get like negative stuff but it's like mm -hmm. that's that's how many people out there who actually dislike what you're saying yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're probably quite a lot um yeah it's also yeah. just you're not held there's also i mean we've touched upon this but with social media and stuff but there's less kind of um uh stimuli right there's there's less there's less social rules um present right like when you're communicating with someone you're held accountable by your actions and your reputation and things like that whereas because this that no longer happens and it's all online you're not held accountable and you can behave in any which way right mm -hmm. um to a degree but mm -hmm. it just yeah, yeah it just completely changes the dynamic and how people relate to each other the and also the i'm going to put something out here which is a bit more controversial and it's not true it's just like a thought experiment and it's like an in it's like a conspiratorial way of thinking for example if you own like a media company right you can tell people what to say and the people are going to get blamed to the people who say it on the newscast because yeah. they'll be like well they said it, it wasn't me yeah. like you get what i mean there is like, yeah 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 like i mean as a thought experiment that would make sense that would be a possibility i'm not yeah. saying that's the truth but like that's probably why conspiracy people like really think that's the case yeah. and to be fair there is times where agendas do get passed down like think about it like the i mean using covid as an example not saying that was conspiratorial at all but it's like the message was propagated across multiple channels and the same message was propagated for the greater yeah. good of humanity right yeah, yeah. So it just goes to show there is some level of ability to collectively choose the messaging that covid is probably a bad example world wars yeah. collectively getting people behind sort of the war effort yeah, propaganda yeah 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 well you've seen that video that of like all the different news channels where they're like yeah. uh you know they're all saying the same exact thing, yeah yeah like, word for yeah. word yeah but the thing the thing about it right is oh this is going to look like we're, we're going to get deep again but like we did that propaganda book and my only conclusion from like propaganda and stuff is everything's always propaganda yeah. Like I remember seeing some extent, like, yeah. somebody's be like, you know that stupid meme with the people like pointing the gun at the back of the astronaut's head and it gets further, further back. It was like, oh, yeah. this is a psyop, this is a psyop, and it's like everything's a psyop. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it technically is. Yeah. Anytime you try and convince somebody of anything, you're technically performing a psychological yeah. manipulation operation yeah, to yeah. try and convince them of something. So it's what uh, it's one of those things. It's just once again, it's, it's consequences. Consequences. What are the reasons? What are the reasons behind it? Why are you doing it? What what does it cause, yeah, etc.? Yeah. And I think yeah. one of the things that we've learned, and from this book, as we'll get onto later, which we're still struggling to get, <laughs> yeah. it's so damn deep and interesting. Yeah, um, is people lose faith as well when they start seeing this and they start putting things together and thinking, "Wow, there's some sort of like collective effort to get us to do yeah. something." Well, I think there's also this like human spirit of people hate being controlled. Yeah, as well, people yeah, hate yeah, yeah, yeah. hate it. So therefore, it's like a massive like, um, what's the word like? Uh, what's the word when your body reacts to like in a foreign invader, like a uh, an immune, immune response? Yeah, it's an immune, yeah, that's it. Immune response. It's an immune response. In my yeah, head. yeah. It's like, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So yes, we will we will get through this right. <laughs> the, so we've just talked about the um, the the advent of the clock and the advent of the hours. So now we're going to talk about and then the changing of the social th sphere with the mass media and print. So now we're moving on to the changing nature of work. So the mechanization of the world had a profound impact on the way we find meaning in our work. The advent of mass production made the final outcome of labor less tangible. In the past, people worked to produce objects that directly supported their own bodily existence and that of those around them. They worked to feed themselves, keep their houses warm, clothe themselves for protection against harsh conditions and societal expectations. However, with the rise of the industrial era, the purpose of work shifted. People now toil to produce objects for distant individuals, losing the immediate connection to the significance of their labour. Moreover, the recipients of one's work became anonymous. The impact of labour on others became invisible and intangible. The disappearance of local, small-scale and craftsmanship-based production severed the direct link between the producer and the consumer. In most cases, those who produced the material good no longer had contact with the person who would ultimately use it. When a product was delivered, the producer no longer witnessed the recipient's joy or gratitude. These visible, subtle physical effects were crucial sources of satisfaction and co confirmation of meaningful work, which is such a good point. Like, you know, seeing yeah. somebody use your product, you'd be like, wow, it's so cool. But at the same point, I'm going to add something here. The, the invention of a brand has replaced that because the, the brand becomes almost a... Uh, an abstract representation of the person like for example brands build up reputations which we then trust which is why we go to the bigger brands yeah, yeah. we trust them because yeah. they build up a reputation for being good at what they do which is mm. essentially what you'd have with this craftsmanship in a small yeah, circle yeah. they build up a reputation like a brand is just an abstract reputation signal for a company 
basically, is what I was trying to yeah. say. About. Um, so the worker, as the saying goes, becomes a mere cog in the industrial machine, motiva- uh, motivated solely by the prospect of earning wages. Labour transformed from a bur- burdensome yet inherently meaningful ex- existential task into a disembodied utilitarian necessity. The exponential growth of administrative and economic sectors economic sector, sorry, can be attributed to deeper psychological tendencies within our own society. The proliferation of rules, procedures, and bureaucracy often arises from interpersonal mistrust and an inability to tolerate uncertainty and risk. Both the government and the general population increasingly demand meticulous correctness in all endeavours. This results in endless procedural provisions aimed at determining financial and legal liabilities should anything go wrong. When human relationships are characterised by inherent distrust, life becomes excessively complex and society expends energy on creating various security mechanisms that in reality further fuel mistrust and ultimately lead to psychological exhaustion. And that is... uh, Yeah. I loved this point. I thought it was just so good. I just... it's, it's, It's just interesting to analyze the change in how we we interact with one another now. Because, I mean, you know, during our whole lives, we've only ever had this kind of way of interacting, um, especially in the West. And the only time that you kind of come across this kind of almost traditional way of, um, you know, the, of uh, having, you know, a customer and a producer is almost when you go to uh, go on holiday to less, um, less off countries and they're still interacting in this way and they have this level of like trust in their community and you kind of, you get that feel. Whereas here you don't as much. I mean, you go to Tesco's, but no, or Sainsbury's, but no one there actually produces the product, right? You, anywhere you go now, unless, okay, yeah, you can go to restaurants and things like that, but it's just, you're, we're a generation and for multiple generations, we've always been stuck in this way of seeing things. So it's quite interesting just analyzing it and being like, oh, this is how it's changed whether for the better or not, but it's still, you know, it brings new new problems as as does anything. Um, I was going to say the the, the, the the detachment from the repercussions of what you do as well, because obviously, let's just say your product causes harm in some form because it's so far away from the people who actually come up with the idea because obviously it's, it's like everything's like sort of multinational now, global almost. You're so detached from the issues you create that you don't feel any level of guilt and you also mm. don't have that level of like social pressure to change. Like if you, if you made a bad batch of something, like let's just say you're a bakery and you gave food poisoning to everybody, everybody who come up to you be like, the fuck are you doing? Like, we're going to yeah, like, you know, precisely. we're going to treat you weird. We're going to treat you suspicion. Like your reputation is ruined. Whereas to some degree, these like big sort of corporate stuff that happens. You're so detached from it. They're just be like, Oh, it's fake news. Or like, do you know what I mean? It's like they create some sort of distraction from it. That makes yeah, sense. you know, so I, I agree to a point. I uh, like I agree that a lot of companies have done that. And I think this is, however, I think that they've done it so much now that so many of these companies have lost credibility. I mean, yes, we look at Tesco's and funnily enough, they've bounced back. But remember how big it was when they were selling <laughs> horse meat, right? Oh, from I mean, Romania. Bad, isn't it? <laughs> it was it was huge. And I think we are starting to see, I mean, just on the fringes of society. But people who want to go back to that kind of old fashioned, I want my local butcher. I want a it's local baker. the artisan stuff, right? You know, it's a like yes. countercultural move towards like, yeah, local bakers, local, like the sort of, they almost call it like the hippie movement, right? Like it's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or it it almost movement, does like feel the, like that, right? Yeah. The artisanal sort of like, um, yeah, the alternative movement, I guess you could just say, just like against the sort of big brands, which it kind of makes sense why you would want that. Like it's. Absolutely. And it it, it breathes a bit of life into things because otherwise it's just so stale. It's cold. You never actually, you know, now if I want to talk to someone about, you know, Mm -hmm. I bought something, the product isn't right. I never get through to a person. I get through to a robot. Right. And Mm -hmm. obviously this is to cater for huge amounts of um, a, a huge number of customers. But the fact is, is that I want to be able to talk to someone about it. And I think that's why people are kind of naturally inclined towards going to these kind of more uh these yeah companies like uh like that something has a face, face. yeah yeah not yeah. Like a faceless uh um, faceless organization where you're just speaking to a different person every time yeah. and there's all this like bureaucracy and i think this also starts to touch on and i think it goes into this later on but this obsession with rules right that we have to follow rules and as a result we never actually navigate anything based on like the context or our own ability to communicate with someone else anymore because it's like oh this is the default this is what i have to do to solve this issue there's no other way to do it because someone's 
prescribed this way of doing it. Um, and I think that's something that we do on a whole societal level. We create rules. We try to map context so that we never actually have to figure it out or exert any effort to do something because we just follow rules. And in this country, I mean, we're incredibly complacent, but um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it depends on like the conditioning from the past that that leads to this complacency to some degree. Yeah. Um, well, I think there's an element of trust. I mean, like, you know, it's all well and good having rules and having a bit of a guide to to behave in a, in a way, but don't follow rules for the sake of it. It's the thing that Jordan Peterson always says, right? As in like, mm-hmm. okay, you can you can change the rules when you're a master, but also there's an element of trust in those rules. You want to trust that the people who have made those rules have made them for a good reason rather than just for the benefit of themselves. Yeah, and also hold them, hold the rules to like hold yeah. the same rules to themselves. Like, I mean, everybody hates double standards. Like, oh, in terms of like you know, yeah. it's one of the first signs of corruption, isn't it? Like giving giving some people rules and rules for different people. It's like, yeah. you know, that's not that's not the essence of society to some degree, is it? Let's be honest. Like, yeah. oh, they get away so, scot-free with cr- creating yeah. crimes and... You know, if you're if you don't have the money to defend yourself, you're immediately put in prison, right? Type of shit. It's like, yeah, it's is, like is you see this a lot of time with like politicians who you know end up investing in companies that suddenly get a big deal from the government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh God. yeah. Or is there, or is their friend, or is their friend who did it, or whatever? Yeah, like, exactly. And got the contract for something. Yeah. yeah, cronyism, I think it's called, isn't it? Um, oh God, it's irritating. So, how harmful drugs reach the market? The testing process for pharmacological drugs is indeed extensive, but it is important to acknowledge that the phenomena of health or the reaction to a drug is highly complex and multifaceted. Researchers can only measure and monitor a limited number of specific responses, such as the impact on certain symptoms or physiological indicators like blood pressure or respiration. They are unable to capture and understand the entirety of the individual's response to the drug. And this is something we've talked about a lot, but the idea that, you know, you can only measure what you can measure. We only have certain tools to measure certain components of our health, other other tools we don't have. And so our end result will be based on only the things that we can measure. Um, Moreover, the duration of research studies is typically limited and the focus is primarily on short term effects. This means that potential side effects that may emerge later, even across generations, cannot be fully accounted for during the testing phase. An example of this is the thalidomide tragedy, where the harmful effects of the drug were not initially apparent but became evident years later. Additionally, some side effects may be subtle and not immediately detectable during the testing period. These effects can accumulate over time and have significant consequences, such as a decrease in general immunity. And we'll touch upon this a a lot more later in the book, the kind of medicalization, but I think it's just worth noting all of that. Yeah, well, well, we will get into more detail and obviously when it gets into sort of the coronavirus and stuff, but yeah, it's Mm. it's a useful primer to realize that, you know, you know, some of the importance of some of this medical research is like the time, you know, like yeah. thalidomide is a prime example. <clears throat> you know, it wasn't tested on pregnancies. Next thing you know, you've um, got kids. I'm pretty sure was being born right like arms and legs, wasn't it? And stuff like that. Yeah, just yeah. That's pretty horrendous, isn't it? So yeah, terrible. Yeah. So chapter three, uh, the artificial society. So the logic and rational explanation of a natural phenomenon no matter how comprehensive, inevitably involves abstraction. Theoretical models, while valuable in understanding the world, can never fully encapsulate the complexity of the phenomenon they seek to explain. There always remains an unexplained aspect, an essential and living component that defies complete comprehension. This can be as observed in the distinction between natural and artificial products. When we attempt to reproduce a natural phenomenon through rational analysis such as genetically engineered plants, lab-printed meat, vaccine-induced immunity, or high-tech sex dolls, the artificial reproduction is never identical to the original. The loss or difference may not always be immediately apparent, sometimes even barely perceptible, yet it is significant on both physical and psychological levels. A prime example of this digitalization of human interactions where human, uh, sorry, where human real connections are replaced by digital substitutes. Although these digital interactions may offer convenience and accessibility, they cannot fully replicate the richness and depth of genuine human engagement, being such as like touch and stuff like that yeah. and like yeah. cues like i don't know i mean you can obviously see facial cues on on a on like a on like a video let's just say but it's not quite the same is it when you're in person no yeah exactly uh, and i think there's yeah i mean you know 
you can hear what other people are doing around you. You can like mm. noises. I mean, um, yeah. the heat, temperature, texture, all these things facilitate. Um, I'll say a know, prime example of the digital stuff is like, you know, when you text and it just loses all context. Oh, you, yeah. It's like really terrible. brutal or something. Yeah. And you're like, so for example, if you're going to make a joke, you usually put like a smiley face or a winky yeah, yeah. face or like a, yeah. like, cause you can like, otherwise it just looks like you're being a brutal, like a brutal yeah. fucking like you're yeah, just, yeah. yeah. It's, um, you yeah. can't get across your inflection or your, you know, there's also lag in when you talk to people. So there's multiple, multiple components that can impact, you know, conversing yeah. digitally. Um, all right. So the downside of digital interactions, <clears throat> What makes digital interactions so appealing? Why did we willingly embrace text message over face-to-face -face conversation long before the onset of coronavirus crisis? Certainly the convenience of communicating with distant individuals through digital means play a significant role. However, there is another psychological factor at play. Uncertainty is an inherent aspect of humans' experience. No other animal is as plagued by doubt or burdened by existential questions, particularly in our interactions with others. How can I be of assistance to the other person? Do they like me? Do they find me attractive? Do I hold any significance in their life? What are the <laughs> expectations of me? In a digital conversation, the other person is physically distant yet still within reach. Through this medium, the, the eternal questions along with their associated uncertainties and fears become somewhat less acute. There's a greater sense of control as one can choose what to reveal and what to conceal. In essence, People tend to feel psychologically safer and more at ease behind the digital barrier, but this comes at the cost of a diminished connectedness. This is literally the reason for internet trolls. You know, yeah. like yeah, you know, a hundred percent. Like for example, if they were in like a like a public space where they know that the person they were about to insult would absolutely destroy them or something, because they yeah. they see the cues of like this person's like a big burly bloke or something. Yeah, uh, they would not open their mouth the way they do online. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so interesting, isn't it? Like, and also this idea of like you having these like ambient questions in your head, like, does this person mm -hmm. like me? Does this person think I'm attractive? What was the other ones? Does this person, uh, do I hold any significance yeah. in their life? Whatever. It's so true. Like how these questions, like inadvertently, they're not like, what's the most way putting it? They're not like directly asked. I don't think mm -hmm. you ever ask yourself directly. Like, Oh wow. Does this person like me? Whatever. It's like, you almost have a feeling of it. Do you kind of get what I mean? You yeah, almost yeah, feel yeah. like you feel self-conscious when they give you like, a remark that makes you, feel like they're judging you for example yeah. and it's so interesting that and it does make sense that through like the digital medium you just don't have the same level of um fears i guess i mean like fuck it like even us doing this podcast right now right um is a lot different doing it recording it and then putting it out then imagine doing this live in front of like 100 yeah, yeah, yeah. people it's completely yeah. different um because we see their faces we see the reactions you know absolutely absolutely um and yeah i just think once again it's you know when you're not i mean whatever kind of action you uh, whatever kind of thought or action you engage in can become a pattern but it's also you know it can also work that skill in this case you know when those things uh, when you're deprived of those extra kind of sensory stimuli you don't work on it as much and so you know if you're always resorting to you know texting then you get more nervous about calling you know, yeah. you get more nervous about seeing someone in person and actually like conversing about them. It's it's just yeah, a, right. it's a slippery slope. Yeah, you, you, know? you get you get so conditioned or used to that feeling mm. of like non anxiousness. Safety. Yeah, comfort. But then yeah. you know we've talked about this numerous times. You need a bit of harm. You need a bit of uncomfortability to push you into those zones where you grow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, we were even saying this earlier in the podcast with like the idea of, you know, uh, turning pro and having like a breakup or something, something that like forces you to live with the uncomfort and make a decision upon yeah, yeah. what are you yeah, going to do? Absolutely. Like, are you going to, you're going to wallow in your own self pity or are you going to mm. go out and do something? Um, yeah, yeah, precisely. So yeah, we'll, we'll finish off this last point then. So yeah. why is mankind so hateful, hopelessly seduced by the mechanistic ideology? So it's partly because we've become under the influence of the following illusion that one is able to remove the discomforts of existence without having to question oneself at all. This illusion is particularly evident in modern medicine, where suffering is often attributed to a mechanical defect in the body or an external agent like a pathogenic organism. The focus is on a localised cause that can be controlled, managed and manipulated without delving into the psychological, ethical or moral complexities of the individual. It is belief that a pill or a surgical procedure can alleviate our problems without addressing their deeper origins. 
While the practical applications of mechanistic science have undoubtedly made life easier in some ways, they have also distanced us from the essence of life itself. Much of this process occurs at a subconscious level, but the increase in acute mental suffering we witness in society serves as a clear indication of the surface level impact. Within this context, Hannah Arendt identifies a subtle, subtle undercurrent of total totalitarianism, an ideology that emerges from an uncritical devotion to science and the misguided belief that a flawless artificial being and a utopian society can be engineered through scientific knowledge. Arendt warns against the idealization of science as a magical cure for the inherent difficulties of existence and as a means to fundamentally transform human nature. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's kind of tying it all together there being like, you know, Absolutely. as you as you can see this sort of rise, of like believing in like a quantifiable metric, this rise of believing one true way of doing things has led to this idea that there's one way to, to structure society as well, right? Like yeah. society is just another mechanism that can be managed, controlled, turned into something that's perfect. Yeah. But once again, who defines that, right? Like the multidimensional, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tackling this kind of, I mean, that's the paradox of life, isn't it? That we have, we want to be comfortable and safe and have security, but to grow or to live life, I mean, life is always throwing things at you. You have to be able to, you have to be willing to accept that you're not always going to be comfortable and that you do have to grow. And this is like, you know, leading to this ideology in society that, oh, you know, we need to be safe. We need to be secure. I mean, that's why there's so much kind of fear that is enhanced in society or exacerbated. And as a result, then we're provided with these solutions like, oh, this will keep you safe. And people have fallen into that way of seeing things rather than seeing it like, okay, well, maybe this, maybe I need to confront this. Maybe I need to get something out of this. Maybe I need to grow and overcome yeah. it. Maybe I need to build on these tools. Um it's yeah it's funny because it kind of like this is why i love sort of like the whole reading quite widely because then you end up putting connections for really disparate areas but yeah like, yeah anti-fragile he talks a lot about this idea of like stresses and improving systems yeah. so for example yeah. stress ex exists to reveal sort of inadequacies in the, uh, inadequacies in a system for it to be strengthened in the future right yeah so it's the same thing with humans yeah. like the stressor yeah. is the discomfort it's the it's the Absolutely. inability to do something and then it's like how do you overcome that do you do you look for somebody who's going to provide you with all the answers or do you go out and try and you know figure out the answer for yourself or, or come up with yeah. a solution that's like not i guess not not handed to you so to speak um, yeah. and don't get me wrong we all rely on you know experts and people to solve certain problems for us that we can't serve which is yeah. half the reason we have the society we do which is like people can provide value that we need that we can't provide because you know we'd have to train you know seven years to be a, a medical student right you know it's like to do the to do medicine therefore we're relying on the, this expertise but there comes a point where like you can't just take everything without having the discomfort yourself and trying to find yeah, some yeah. solutions in some aspects of life not not all but yeah yeah no, of we course. kind of try to eradicate this level of like oh he he feels uncomfortable it's like you know that sort of like um political correctness movement it's like you're making me feel uncomfortable now yeah stop and it's like, okay, fine, I get it. Like, people shouldn't make other people feel uncomfortable. And there is certain areas where, obviously, like, you yeah, know, if you're yeah, staring at some, somebody weirdly and, like, you know, making them feel uncomfortable, fair enough, you probably yeah. shouldn't do that. But there comes a point where some people, when it's, like, something that shouldn't make them discomforted, like, discomforted, they should almost look inside a little bit as well and be like, okay, why am I feeing uncomfortable? Yeah, yeah. Okay. or why are they making me uncomfortable? I yeah, think that exactly. there's this, there's this notion, there's almost, there's almost, an entitled notion to it you know that we are born and that we should have the uh, we sh we are entitled to not feel uncomfortable but at the end of the day life is not like that right you don't get yeah. to navigate through it's almost like you're still kind of being um molly coddled by parents and it's why you know the term nanny state has almost come come about because it's like we're abdicating any kind of um well responsibility but also you know any reason to feel uncomfortable to someone else and that they should look after it. And it just, it doesn't allow us to actually confront why we might be uncomfortable or what, you know, why someone's once again, why someone's making us feel uncomfortable, why we're being uncomfortable. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a journey we need to explore with ourselves. Maybe 
And, you know, you can see that yeah. a lot in I'm, political hey, correctness, I'm, someone getting yeah. upset on someone else's behalf, not even something mm-hmm. that's happening to them, but what's happening to someone else, even if that person doesn't have a problem with it, you know? And it's it's an interesting, like, kind of journey that they need to explore in themselves, I think. Mm. I was even going to add something along the lines of so a lot of the uncomfort nowadays as well as, you know, projected onto objects and also like mechanistic th- like styles so like mm. okay you're feeling uncomfortable therefore it's some sort of something wrong with you you've got some sort of mechanistic issue rather than maybe it's a completely multi-dimensional complex issue with the current relationships you have with all your friends and family like 100 it's not just like you know often it's like you have this one person in your life is doing this one person in your life is doing this there's some sort of like this like m- yeah so there's some sort of multivariant reason for why you're feeling the way you're feeling rather than just like oh you've got like an imbalance in your brain like you know, let's, let's give you a pill it's like well let's just think about what's causing the imbalance okay maybe it's like you're feeling like you're exiled from certain relationships and not in others and therefore you're exactly. feeling anxious there and that not there so like it's like looking for the other causes apart from just the once again the like the why and not the how like oh we can see yeah, what's yeah. happening we can see what it is but we don't know why it's happening you know yeah like there, there's yeah, no yeah. theory for why your body dysregulates itself right yeah. Oh, your body just decides let's just not function properly, right? There's, there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's things outside of outside of that that's causing it. So, yeah, yeah, precisely, precisely. So yeah, that would be. We're going to leave it there, I think. And yeah. We, I mean, we've obviously gone deep into sort of everything that we've we've spoken about, and unfortunately, we only go deeper for the next one. So. <laughs> <laughs> or fortunately, we really I think this is a good point to. End to finish there because it kind yeah. of does like you said does tie everything that we've kind of been talking about together and then the next bo- next point is kind of a shift in that um yeah so yeah so that's, that's the first it, part and that's the wrap we'll look forward to doing the next one yeah sounds good Hey guys, well there you have it. We hope you enjoyed that book summary. Now we know it can be a lot to take in all at once, so if you wanna be able to read this in a more palatable size, or you wanna be able to implement any of those key actionable ideas that we were talking about in this episode, head on over to our website at wisewords.blog where the book summary will be waiting for you. Also, don't forget to check out our socials as we consistently upload the key ideas, benefits, and actionable ideas from all the books that we read. The links to those will be in the description below. Now, we want to be able to get you the best content in a way that's really easy to understand, but we need your help. Your opinion matters. So you are our feedback mechanism. And with those quick actions, whether that's leaving us a like or a dislike, commenting in the comment section below or subscribing to our channel, all of those help us gauge what we're doing well and how to improve on our method of delivery. So if you have any thoughts on the matter, don't hesitate to act. It takes less than 10 seconds and it really helps us out. But with all that being said, 